um, artist curator panel conversation. It's a program. Oh, there we go. It's a program that is part of the month long RPM exhibition put together by Gen Art Silicon Valley. So my name is Amanda Rawson and I am the current, current co-chair of Gen Art Steering Committee with Frederick. Uh, you see him here. And um, let's see, Gen Arts is a program of Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley Creates. It's the Santa Clara County Arts Grants Provider. And Gen Arts is dedicated to assembling, supporting, and empowering the thriving arts community in Silicon Valley through professional development, advocacy, and networking. We are an all-volunteer subcommittee, and if you or someone you know is interested in learning more about Gen Arts, please reach out to us through our website, genartssb.org. So I'm super excited to introduce our guests, um, panelists tonight. We have three incredible women curators who will be speaking about their curatorial experience and share expeditions uh, held at each of their respected institutions, uh, we, which also happen to all be on the same block in, um, in Sofa District in downtown San Jose. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them in order that they will be presenting this evening. If you have any questions for them, please um, go ahead and place them in the chat and we can get to that during the Q&A portion. So I'm going to read from their bios. So, um, Mariela Perez, a practicing visual artist, curator, and DJ, joined Mocklin in 2019 as the visual arts engagement coordinator and serves as the lead for exhibitions and related programming. She earned a bachelor's degree from UC Santa Cruz and is active in the local arts community. She has six years of experience planning, organizing, and hosting local arts events in San Jose and curating both visual and performing arts shows in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. She is Mako's curator and public programs manager. Welcome. Our next is Amy DiPlacido, is a visual artist and curator based in Northern California. She has held the position of curator of exhibitions at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles since 2016, where she has organized numerous contemporary textile exhibitions and programs. She received an MFA in fiber from Cranbrook Academy of Art and a BFA in fiber from Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Amy serves on the board of directors of the Friends of the, oh, I'm gonna butcher this, I'm so sorry, Eachel Museum where she co-presented Mayan Traje, a tradition in tra tra transition in 2019. Thank you. Welcome, Amy. And last but not least, Christine Copes, yes, is the curator and director of public programs at the Institute of Contemporary Art, San Jose, ICA. She's curatorial focus is uh, her curatorial focus is on work that explores the critical issues of our time through the lens of contemporary art, with an emphasis on emerging and mid-career California artists. Copas has lived and worked in the Bay Area for more than 10 years. From 2013 to 2018, she, has, she was assistant curator of exhibitions and programs at the Bedford Gallery in Walnut Creek, California. She received her BA in art history from University of California, Berkeley in 2012. Go Bears. Uh, <laughs> so welcome. And we're gonna go ahead and see presentations from the three curators. Um, please, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to put it into the chat box. Um, and if you don't, and you just, you realize you have some at, during the conversation, you can do it then. Um, but we definitely have some questions for our curators uh, if they're, if y'all are not ready to post anything in chat. So I will mute myself and let the first person present. Hi everyone, I'm Mariela Perez. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I'm, I'm representing Makla, Makla's curator. Let me just share my, uh, share my screen. Uh, so this first photo was actually taken, um, I think like the week that I came in, which I started in April, um, no, actually I started the week before this photo was taken, uh, March, the end of March, 2019, which was at the time when we were installing our yearly auction and exhibition, which is Latino Art Now. Um, so that's where, that's where this photo is coming from. MACLA stands for Movimiento de Arte y Cultura Latinoamericana. We are an inclusive contemporary arts space grounded in the Latinx experience. Um, there's three different branches within Makla, we have performing arts, visual arts, and then we also have the Teen Tech Center for Teens. And this is a photo of our staff this past Halloween, we, which we hadn't seen each other for like, I mean, at least together, we weren't, we hadn't seen each other for a while because of COVID. So it was, it was a really nice, um, nice time to be able to see our staff. We are a really small team. 
as you can see. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about my curatorial work. Um, when it comes to putting together exhibitions, I really aim to hit these three things, these three eyes, I guess you can say, which is to be inclusive within the, which within the Latinx experience is really hard because, I mean, even the word Latinx and the politics be behind that word, that word are, it's its own thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, we do want to be as representative as we can for folks that, that are, for the artists that are making, creating art that have um, some kind of Latin American background to them. And so definitely wanting to be in inclusive of um, the work that is being out there, being intentional also and making sure that, you know, that the exhibitions that we are presenting are engaging in conversations of the world around us. I think that there's, especially now that there's so much, there's so much just happening around us that I, when it comes to, you know, the work that we showcase at MACLA, we really want to um, bridge the conversations that are happening on a national level, on a local level, on a state level. And for this particular exhibition, which is what this photo is of, um, it's called, it was called Our Connection to the Land. And we had artists show work that was connected somehow to agriculture. And so even in this photo, you see work from Susie Gonzalez, who is an artist based out of San Antonio, Texas. We have Arlene um, Correa Valencia, who is at, based out of Napa. She, she does these, uh, these crates, these crate paintings. And then we also have an artist <clears throat> based out of here in San Jose um, that was born out of the Central Valley. So it was kind of just like mixing. It was really interesting. And then we also, aside from this, uh, we want to this. We have um, Narciso Martinez, who is originally from Oaxaca, but is based out of Long Beach for this particular piece. He, he, uh, he was a farm worker for a long time. And so he has just background in just being able to work the land. And so this particular piece was created out of um, packaging boxes. And so it was really interesting to just see how all of their work was in conversation with each other. There was another artist that wasn't pictured, um, but she has, she's originally based out of New York. So it was just, I think for me, it was a really beautiful show just to be able to show how not only um, are Latinx folks or folks from Latin America that are living here in the US connected to our food, but also just being able to, to show what the, what the experience is from a Latino or Latinx artist um, in connection to the to either the food we're eating, the way that we interact with the land, the way that um, that the land sometimes ends up being a border, a literal border be between us and family members. Um, also, how sometimes, like and for this, for example, in this particular piece, how you know a lot of the times, even though a lot of you know Latino folks are the ones working the lands. You don't actually get to see their faces, which I think, was, I mean, this particular piece was super beautiful. And um, it was also such so cool that it was, it's a mural just made out of cardboard itself. So this was one exhibition that, that we had up. And I believe this was the one that we had right before COVID hit. So this came down, I believe it was like February 20, 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, I'm going to share a little bit about some of the exhibitions I've curated. This was a, another one called Capturing the Then and Now. And so for this particular exhibition, I was really interested in showcasing the work of Latino artists that were using film, whether it was like photos or actual film as their medium. So we had artists such as like Felix Quintana, who was um, taking images based out of, you know, Google Maps essentially in his neighborhood and manipulating them and using, developing them via cyanotype. Um, we were also showcasing for this particular exhibition, music videos that were made by Latinx artists. So this little snapshot is of an artist um, named Jasmine Garcia, who's based out of LA. Um, she ended up directing and producing this video for Cuco which is what this little screenshot is. Um, but yeah, it ended up, it was, I was really cool. I'm really fascinated with connecting, you know, what 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 does the art world look, or what does the art world look like within the, the Latinx experience? Like what is being created? 
what do, what do those colors look like? What do they smell like? I mean, obviously we can't, you can only smell so much, but you know what I mean? Like, what is the feeling? And I think within Latinx art, there's just so much heart, there's so much color, there's so much emotion um, that comes out of it. And so this was a, a means to capture it um, with artists that were using film to do that. And then this image is of our most recent exhibition, which was the Natalia Anciso solo exhibition that actually came down um, on the 15th of this month. And so Natalia Anciso, she focuses her works on family separations at the border, but she was also, she was also just really curious at, uh, on creating artwork around just separation in general. And I think when, it, when COVID hit, she really took it upon herself to make art around that. And so this particular installation was honoring folks that had passed due to COVID. Um, the, the little pictures that are here in the back, we did a community call where we asked folks if you know, they had any loved ones that had passed away due to COVID, if they wanted to send in an image of them. And then we had a few folks that did. And then what ended up happening is Natalia was able to then like make portraits of them and then we hung them up. And at the same time, we were as, a, as, some, as an engagement activity or just a way to really just be in conversation with our audience. We also had frames available for folks if they wanted to add to the installation. Um, we had a little couch set up in front of it. it I think it, considering that it was our first open um, exhibition, you know, well, even though we're still in a pandemic, um, I think it, it really made people pause and it was also very beautiful, very moving to just, you know, hold space for, for the fact, you know, that we're living in this world currently. And this is another image of Natalia and Ciso's work. But yeah, that's, that's all I have to share. Right now we are um, installing our, for our next exhibition, which will be opening this upcoming first Friday. So definitely stop by if you're in the area. It's gonna be called All Our Senses and it's a three person artist show. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I appreciate you sharing kind of the beginning and where you're at now. And we definitely will have questions. <laughs> um, and just so people know, I kind of did this in the way of, um, the institutions are when I look at the at the buildings. So Maria or Makla is to uh, just the north end of the block, and um, San Jose Museum of Clothes and Textiles in the middle, and then ICs after. That's why we have you going in that order. So, Amy, we're excited to hear from you next. Okay, great. Let me just share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? Okay, perfect. Well, hi everyone. My name is Amy DiPosito and I am the curator of exhibitions at San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, like Amanda said. And I just want to start off by thanking Amanda and Kristen and the whole Gen Arts team for inviting me today and curating a wonderful group of arts professionals. And of course I had to start off my presentation with a meme, if you know me. You know that I love memes and have actually created exhibitions around this. I'm really drawn to memes because it's image plus text and similarly curators use the same tools to create or tell a story. I often think about my role as a curator, as a forecaster of the future, what will be relevant in one to two years from now since we work in uh, such a long ways away, especially because all of our exhibitions have been postponed due to COVID. We're always thinking what's going to be relevant in the future. And with new digital technologies, it poses an interesting question of who can make art and who can tell that story. Every path to becoming a curator is different. And I literally went from a scrappy girl sewing fabric together to receiving a BFA from Massachusetts College of Art and Design and um, an MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art, which is one of the more just interdisciplinary programs um, for fiber arts. It's also known for its legacy and craft. 
Then after graduating, I took off a year to travel through um, artists in residence programs throughout the country. At my core, I'm a big museum nerd and I attribute my love for these institutions as I spent the cold New England days inside reading or going to museums, daydreaming about what other kids in Florida or California were doing. So naturally I became a museum professional on the founding team of the Make Shop at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. It was here that I learned about the Progressive Museum, the blog Museum 2.0, and the unintended barriers that museums form around them. And I knew my work would keep me in this field of museums or other informal learning environments. And as you can see, the Make Shop is an analog and digital hands-on workshop space that was created to have poignant moments between families and children. Um, so then I was appointed to the curator of exhibitions role at um, SJMQT. And that was after um, working in their public programs department and as a curatorial assistant. And so this is one of the first major exhibitions that I put together. I was thinking about what is relevant in our time. And um, for some reason I had a Massachusetts holiday while I was growing up and it was the same day as Columbine. So I watched the whole day unfold um, as a child as it was happening in Colorado. And I even had extended family over then because I think it was near a holiday. And um, this really struck me to my core and I knew that I wanted to bring this, this it, social issue into the exhibition format. Uh, I felt like I had a social responsibility to create a show around guns and to show it. And I also was thinking about my background in museums and loving them. And I wanted to create a physical space where neighbors could come in with other neighbors that they maybe didn't know have those challenging conversations um, and really relay their differing perspectives. Um, so you can see that we had a juried exhibition. Um, we collaborated with a program called Studio Art Quilt Associates. And you can see um, here that there's a piece that references the shooting at Pulse nightclub. Um, whenever this happened, I realized that gun violence wasn't going away in our country. And then we also borrowed a cue from Museum 2.0 and had um, a voting area where people could kind of see responses and see themselves reflected in the museum environment. Um, I skipped a slide there. Sorry about that. So many people outside of the arts claim that they are not creative or they don't know enough about art to have an entry point. And I tend to be drawn to arts that have multiple concepts within their work. So if I were to give this piece a cold read, I would say that it's a newspaper, it's the New York Times, the artist is thinking about communication. Maybe that brings a idea of the freedom of speech. I also think a lot about labor as a textile curator. And I'm thinking about the labor and time involved cutting the shapes, or maybe it brings you to lace work, the positive and negative space that's around here. And you can even see that some bodies are obscured a little bit as well as the text. So I'm thinking about the fake news, the fragmented reality that we all tend to live in now. So here's my slide I was looking for. This is um, in conjunction with the Guns Loaded Conversation show, we actually found a youth um, organization that was a young nonprofit and their names are Social Justice Sewing Academy. And so um, in conjunction to the gun show, we had youth artists for the first time in our space. So a lot of these artists were age 18 or younger and were having to grapple and uh, create art to deal with um, more adult conversations like um, police brutality, mass shootings, et cetera. Um, also, SJMQT was awarded a sister city grant through the city of San Jose. And so this is a um, social practice piece by the artist Wu Zhu Young. She asks if you are free and if you can spare a moment to mend clothing on the spot. But just in general, at a Colton Textile Museum, um, you can expect to find a range of mediums. And so that's knitting and crocheting, fashion, soft sculpture, dyed cloth like batik and shibori arts, and even world textiles. Um, and I'm proud to say that this was our first bilingual 
exhibition in both English and Mandarin. During COVID, I received a lot of questions like, now that the museum is closed, do you even have a job? What are you working on day to day? And I'm thankfully stayed employed throughout the pandemic through projects like the Artist Spotlight series here, um, where I interviewed over 20 artists. And you can find all of them on the Museum From Home page on the SJMQT website. And so if you're thinking about visiting, um, I'll just let you guys know what is on view now. So we have four or five galleries in our space. And some of you may remember that we had the American Tapestry Biennial on view in 2017. And this is the exhibition of the next iteration. This is ATB 13. It really shows the best of the best of tapestries in the world. And all these works were made on a loom and are woven to be representational as opposed to a grid, which you might think of whenever you think of the woven structure. So these, um, you can get a lot of great um, representational imagery like this figure here. We also have Kira Dominguez Hultgren on view now. So the show is only open for five days when we had to close due to COVID-19. And at the heart of Kira's work is the story of migration. Many workers um, are woven um, to have this impressive range of scale while also referring to her family heirlooms of Polkari, which is um, a um, religious and social um, textile known in the Punjabi region of India. Another important San Jose based artist is Ryan Carrington. And you can see these are pre-worn garments of white and blue collar workers. And his work uses symbols of Americana to discuss issues of labor, class, economics and of the Midwest where he grew up. And keeping in mind of the digital engagement of Google Arts and Culture, um, here is a cheeky favorite holiday of curators. This is Ask a Curator Day. And uh, I know I'll be answering some questions soon, but if I didn't answer and, uh, all of them, you can tune in later in September. And this is uh, a holiday that takes place uh, on social media too. So you can ask any question that you want to know of curators. Um, and will respond on this day. And finally, how to engage with SJMQT. You can visit us and see new murals in Sofa Pocket Park, which we created in conjunction with Vegilution and Local Color. And you can attend free textile talks, which are every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, also, you can visit us on First Fridays. We have a new crafter noon in Sofa Pocket Park. Um, and if you want to visit soon, we actually have a closing reception this weekend. Um, it's August 29th, 3.30 to 6.30, where those three last exhibitions that I mentioned will be celebrating them in a small gathering. So if you're anxious and want to see people again, I encourage you to check that out. So thank you. And I look forward to your questions in a little bit. Ah, thank you so much, Amy. That was thank awesome. You. All right, and now we have Christine. Hi, everyone. Um, Christine Kopis, representing the end of the block um, with the ICA San Jose. So I'm going to share my screen now. And yeah, thanks so much, Amanda, for inviting us here. And even though we all work on the block, we don't get to see each other all the time. So this is like a really fun way for all of us to kind of hang out too. So really happy to be here. So the ICA San Jose stands for the Institute of Contemporary Art San Jose. Um, we are a small nonprofit contemporary art museum. We were established in 1980. We um, are not a collecting institution. So that means we do not have a permanent collection like a lot of institutions do. And um, we are committed to examining the most urgent contemporary issues through the lens of artistic practice. We're located in downtown San Jose. Um, we provide a platform for changing and broadening the art historical canon, providing visibility and critical examination for an inclusive selection of artists of the Bay Area and beyond. So um, we are always free. Right now we're open Thursday through Sundays, 12 to five. And um, we're really focused on contemporary work. So meaning uh, artists living and working today. So in my presentation, I just kind of added a like 
general idea of what type of exhibitions um, we look to bring to the ICA San Jose and kind of like what's on my mind as a curator. So uh, my goal is to present a good rhythm of exhibitions in terms of content, media, and artist backgrounds that reflect, a diverse, that reflect diverse perspectives. So with this, I'm looking at global rising artists. So someone where it would be their first West Coast show, um, of course, focusing on local and emerging artists, their first solo museum project. And when I say local, um, I'm really talking about like the Bay Area as a whole. Um, and then of course, visual pleasure exhibitions. So things more focused on like immersive shows, which has been something that a lot of people come to associate the ICA San Jose with, it really responds to the space and lets artists take over and experiment and kind of push their practice further. And then thematic group exhibitions that are focusing on critical issues in the world. So with that, I just kind of added some exhibitions that I've curated at the ICA San Jose. Looking back at um, a couple previous exhibitions up through what's on view right now and what's coming next. So to give you a little sneak peek of what you can find. Um, so this is Personal Alchemy. This is a group show with Terry Friedman, Maria Paz, and Musée Cisse. So this is um, all Bay Area artists, um, mostly from the East Bay, working in a variety of media, um, but what kind of like combines their work together is this focus on art as like a mental health practice of working through anxieties, whether it's like personal or political, um, around family, meditation, uh, social issues. Um, I also just think aesthetically their work is all very bold and bright. Um, and this exhibition happened to be up during COVID. So it was up for like basically an entire year and like Barely anyone got to see it, which is unfortunate reality of like being curator in 2020. But luckily, we have some good images of the p of the pieces, um, and we actually were a vote center while this exhibition was on view. So people who came to vote at the ICA got to see the show. So I'll take that. Uh, this is Musée Cisse. He's an Oakland-based painter focusing on like the breeze block imagery, which is um, just like architectural component that's like a block that allows for air to move through it. I'm sure we've all seen it in California, um, but he's really focusing on like the mundane as a as like a focus for meditation. And then we have Maria Paz. She's mostly known for her sculptural work, but I was really excited that for the show, she did her first mural piece. So that is something I'm like really happy about um, being a curator and specifically at a place like the ICA San Jose is that we can be a kind of space for people to experiment and try things that are new. Um, so I'm hoping Maria will be doing more murals in the future. And these are just some more installation shots and more sculptural uh, ceramic pieces by Maria Paz and textile pieces by Terry Friedman. Um, her work is very bold and textured um, and a lot of times incorporates words kind of like using her her weavings as a protest sign in a way so her work is very responsive to um, a lot of the pieces in that show were responding to the election the 2016 election and Trump so um, more of like political statements kind of woven into her pieces Another exhibition um, I curated that's very focused on Bay Area artists is Sense of Self. This was a photography show really focused on portraiture and how that can be used to explore identity and selfhood and kind of um, re-examine some historical notions around the portrait as well. This include Marcella Pardo Arisa, Tammy Ray Carland, Erica Demon, Jamil Hulu, Stephanie Siuko, and then we did a collaboration with the San Jose LGBTQ youth space. So I just have some install shots from this show. Um, because of the uh, just kind of like content, the nature of the exhibition, a lot of the pieces were exploring gender identity, queer identity. Um, race, many different like personal expressions. And here we have again, 
um, an artist was able to like really experiment with their work. Erica Demon created this um, kind of like immersive small room within the exhibition where we painted the backdrop of the show of the behind her photo photography or photographic pieces and the floor to match um, the backdrop in the work, which actually is a color that she matched to her own skin tone. So this was, even though like these pieces had been shown before, this was a whole new way to show her work. Um, so really excited that like we could be the place where she got to experiment with this. And then this is a couple images of the youth space collaboration. So in our back small off-center gallery, which we've actually updated and is now called the David Pace Gallery and is expanded and really pretty and everyone should come see it. Um, we invited the youth space to participate in a small exhibition. And that was a really fun collaboration too. So through programs and exhibitions, we're also always looking to collaborate with other San Jose based organizations. So that kind of takes me into what we have on view now. So right now we have Ebony G. Patterson, when the cuts erupt, the garden rings and the warning is a wailing, which is just a phenomenal exhibition. Ebony G. Patterson is a one of those global stars, rising star artists. This is really her first museum exhibition on the West Coast. If you haven't seen her work in person, I really recommend you come out and see the show because images just like can't do it justice. It's just full of detail and like just so many layers. She works in a variety of media. These are cut paper pieces and photographs. She also works in textile. She works um, with photograph and collage or mixed media on paper, paint. Um, it's really, she's just a phenomenal artist. It's someone that I think you're probably gonna see um, hopefully at like SF MoMA and MoMA someday. So I feel really privileged that I was able to work with her and kind of give this platform um, on the West Coast that will hopefully kind of, you know, give her opportunities at bigger institutions down the line. Um, this exhibition originated at CAM St. Louis. So sometimes um, institutions will take traveling exhibitions, which this isn't necessarily traveling. We just took a small show from camp to our space and then we'll return to the artist after. And then I got to augment the exhibition with additional loans like this piece um, and this rooster piece as well. So to just kind of like expand on Ebony's practice, introduce our audience to more of her work if they haven't seen it before and really showcase her use of the garden. This show is on view through September 5th. So I think you only have like a week and a half left to see it. Um, so definitely stop by if you can. And then um, exciting projects coming up. So I, oh, I thought I had it. Oh, here we go. So we started this whole new project during COVID at a time when we couldn't let anybody come into our building and see the exhibitions. We really turned to the facade, the outside of the ICA as an exhibition space. So right now we have this um, fantastic piece by Amir H. Fala. He is um, an LA based Iranian artist um, who really like we came to him with this idea and he just jumped what with it, it was a kind of wild concept, um, but it just turned out so beautiful. I'm so proud of it. So this is all done in vinyl. Um, Amir painted this piece smaller in a studio. We got high res images from him and were able to um, blow up the piece in vinyl and have it as this like big mural. So in a time when the artist can't fly out and install, it was really interesting to kind of work on this project remotely and just be doing everything over Zoom with him. It also includes some actual physical paintings in the window and we covered all of our brick with vinyl as well. So it looks like paint, but it's just this like vinyl sticker. So not going to hurt the building in any way. 
Um, we've had this up for a year and now we are working with our next artist on the next facade project. And that will be Conrad Idri. He is a, a Ghanaian Detroit based artist um, emerging again, like another artist I think we're gonna see everywhere soon. Um, really fantastic figurative painter. So this is just a mock-up. It's gonna look a little bit different in person, but as you can see, it's like pretty similar. We're doing the big mural again, but we're, Amir, uh, Conrad's really pushing the facade project to a new place, adding these like bookmark and postage stamp elements to pop off of the mural. We're also gonna add some text on the sidewalk that I'm really excited about. And then there'll be some sculptural pieces in the window as well. So this will open on October 1st. It's going to be a whole new look on the front of our building. And I really just kind of love how it, it just makes such a bold statement about who we are and what we are. I think we're kind of this little brick building that's starting to kind of shrink amongst these big apartment complexes as they go up. Um, and it really kind of stakes our claim as a contemporary art space. And also one that's for many different communities in San Jose. Um, I'm really looking at artists for the facade project who are talking specifically about immigration and um, just connecting with a variety of communities. And so with this facade project, we're also going to open on October 1st, a solo show by Conrad. So this is going to be an exhibition somewhat related to the facade project, but um, all his painting works. So this will be called Chapters of Light. Um, it'll be a solo show in our main gallery and it's going to feature some pieces that have been shown before along with about six new works that will be in this new kind of like monochrome style that he's been working in over the past couple years. Um, I also have some ideas for, this gonna be like an interactive portrait room where you can kind of be a sitter in your own portrait. And because every exhibition I do now has vinyl, there will be a vinyl wall um, of photography by Conrad as well. And then one last little teaser that I don't think a lot of people have seen. Um, we, after Conrad, so now we're talking about 2022, we have a Korean American artist, Sue Sunny Park, who will be flying out to the ICA to install viewing filter Veil of Vision, a project that has been in the works for many years and postponed because of COVID is now finally happening. And it will be a total immersive experience talking about light as a sculptural element, um, it's, these are kind of these like sneak peek preview shots of what she set up in her studio, but the entire, uh, ICA space is going to be filled with these nets with reflective material. Um, and you'll be able to walk through with the flashlight and kind of interact and like see the light bounce back and forth and change as you move through. So we have a lot of exciting things happening at the ICA. Um, so come yeah, stop by. Again, I highly recommend you come see the Ebony G. Patterson show before it closes on September 5th. So yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Christine. That was amazing. Um, wow, you three are doing really incredible work on that small block. Just wanna throw that out there now before I don't get a chance to say it. <laughs> uh, we do have some questions. So I, I have, some, you know, I think part of this conversation is also to for those who maybe don't understand the the world of um, curating, um, the kind of probably are really basic to the three of you. Um, but to those who are looking in, I think it speaks kind of to what your meme was pushing, uh, Amy, the an um, outsider's look um, on what you all kind of your process looks like. So uh, we did have a question from somebody. It says, do curators work solo or are these concepts a team collaboration? What is the idea development process like? Um, and I don't know, if we can, the three of you can each say if um, your own process or if it's, you know, some things that are similar, um, whoever wants to go first, uh, go ahead and just take it away. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll go first there just to say that it is a hybrid of both solo work and teamwork. I work very closely with um, my director, the assistant curator, even our marketing team. Like whenever we're thinking about titles for exhibitions, I feel like that's a highly collaborative uh, process with other 
people in, that I work with too. And we have about, you know, 10 people, uh, still a very small museum. Um, and then in terms of how we formulate ideas, um, actually my curators to the other side of me will know that we have um, an exhibition committee too. So even that process is never really alone. We put out a couple names, people email us a couple names um, or concepts of shows. And then it's really a discussion and we kind of go back to our desks and think about the placement of each show that we'd like to move forward with. Yeah, I'll just, I mean, add on to that. There are a lot of moving parts with an exhibition um, and a majority of our team is like doing something on that work. So it's definitely not a one person thing, but in addition to a curator, you typically have um, a registrar. So somebody who's really in charge of the like shipping of the work, management of um, the care of the work. So even though we don't have a collection as works go up, um, they're really making sure that the integrity of the work is, is just maintained and that it, you know, throughout the exhibition, if anything needs to get adjusted, the registrar is the one in charge of that. Um, we also, of course, always have like a team of installers that helps put the work up, but they're also involved early on in the conversation to talk about what is uh, possible with installation with the artist. Um, and then like Amy said, marketing, the director of course is involved because fundraising is a huge part of it. We need to make sure we're paying artists um, for their work. So fundraising is like the first thing is like, once you have a good idea, getting with your development director, your executive director to really get the word out to people who might be interested in supporting the show. Um, and it's also a really collaborative process with the artists, which might be obvious, but um, really a lot of the planning for me as a curator is meeting with the artist and going over concepts, available work for the show, even though I'm the one that lay, I lay out the exhibition, but I do it really closely with the artist. Um, and I also kind of share that role with even like writing. Like I try to keep as much of the artist's words um, in the labels and the curatorial text as well. So. Um, the, I think like my main partner in curating will is always the artist. Mariela, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, at MACA, we are, like I said, a very, very small team. Like there's probably like five or six of us. Um, but one of the cool things is that because of that, I do get a lot of liberty when it comes to curating. And also if I do ever have any questions, our executive director, Angie, has pretty much had every role within Makla. Like she started off um, during when she was in college as an intern, then was the visual arts coordinator. Eventually she was a curator. So she, I think she's been such a great resource to me and is always like super available to, for me to run ideas through, you know, with her and um, discuss any, cause sometimes I do get stuck. I'm like trying to figure out how to how to be intentional with the work and also how to just present it. And so, um, yeah, it's been, it's been really great. We do, because we are a nonprofit, we do apply for grants. And so um, a lot of our exhibitions are also like at times like three years planned in advance. And so sometimes we do have to like, we have wiggle room obviously around that, but um, just also trying to understand like what are some, like what are some conversations we can engage in that are still gonna be happening between now and like three years from now um, because the issues or the topics are so big that, you know, it's something that's still gonna be around. So it's always, that's always really interesting and also fun to just think, try to think ahead and cover as much as you possibly can, which is also impossible to do, but yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I know it sounds like there's similarities, right? I mean, there's the the similarities I would say are definitely the advance, the, looking at calendars in advance, thinking about the conversations with the artists, um, collaborating with your team, um, and and having conversations with directors. You know, um, I think all of that plays hand in hand, and then of course the fundraising, right? Whether that is from donors or it's from grants, so. Um, that thank you for giving us that insight. And I 
I actually, I have had the, the, the I've been uh, very, just to throw this out there, I've been lucky enough to be able to sit on the exhibition committee for the Quilts and Textiles Museums, and that's been exciting to see the behind the scenes. Um, I want to, I have another question here, and uh, let's see, it says, um, what advice do you three have for those looking to get into curating, working in programs such as residencies or museums? I can start with that one. Um, yeah. So I actually don't have any like art school experience. I didn't go to school for this. Um, I, before working here, I was very much in the DIY scene where I really love just, you know, curating events. I also DJ, so whether it's just trying to figure out like who would be a good fit for a show at a, you know, at a park or at someone's house or at a bar or something like that. And that ended up kind of for me also moving into the art world, um, I think it was like, I want to say like seven years ago, I had moved into a new house with my friends, with the other friends, and we had a bunch of wall space and came up with the idea of just hosting art shows in our, in our house. And so for a while, I think for like two, three years after we were doing, it was just like every few months we would just throw an art show. And then from there, I, I like solo started like contacting um, like coffee shops, like. I at some point did an art show at Social Policy, which isn't, isn't up anymore, but, um, or isn't around anymore, I should say. But I really encourage, you know, folks to, I'm very much like in the, with the mindset of like, by any means necessary, like, you don't need like, obviously like, you know, institutions do provide more access to, to spaces and things like that. But, um, but there's also, you know, there, there's also skills that you can collect along the way on your own um, and, you know, you, you do have the ability to create spaces as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Mariela. That's that's great. I think that's a great start. Who'd like to go next? You both unmuted. <laughs> yeah, I can go. Um, I, I agree um, that like, you know, education is actually not super necessary, which I think is going to be uh, probably different if you ask a different group of curators. Um, on the higher museum level, they, they you know, you can look at their um, job requirements. They're going to probably say a master's or PhD, and I don't have either of those. So I think there is a bigger movement towards um, looking beyond that, not requiring high level of education, especially in a field where, um, you know, you're probably not going to get paid a whole lot. So to require someone to pay so much on education is kind of um, just not totally reasonable. So um, if, if getting a master's and PhD in our history is not really something you're interested in, there are other avenues um, to becoming a curator. And I think it's just, of course, like interning. Um, for me, it was really about um, working in small institutions like the ICA and the Bedford Gallery, more nonprofit art spaces that are only gonna have a handful of full-time staff because then you really get to see what each person does and get um, really there's more opportunity to like step in and learn new things. And also just um, managing up. Like I just like really, you know, when you have ideas for an exhibition, if you know the curator's working on a group show, um, don't be afraid to, share some ideas you have or just email and be like, oh, I saw this artist, I think it would be great. Um, I think that as long as you know you have a good manager that's willing to um, really support you, that, that to me was like the best thing is like, just really putting myself out there and having the opportunity to curate alongside um, a lot of mentors. Um, but I also know that there are some really good programs in the Bay Area that are always taking ideas for exhibitions. So places like um, Root Division in San Francisco, and I think Southern Exposure also does this as well. You could submit uh, proposals for a group exhibition, and at least that way you're kind of getting some something on your resume as a curator. Um, Control Alt, I think is what it's called, and um, it's a gallery space in West Oakland, if there's if they're still doing it, they're one as well. So yeah, I would kind of do some research on, um, there's different listservs that are taking submissions. So just as an artist would submit proposals for uh, their work, curators can do the same. 
Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I'll just chime in and say that I um, applaud everything that the other two curators just said. I was going to mention um, Roof Division as well. And there you can get a stipend at least and then have some hands-on experience talking to artists, doing studio visits, writing a description of work, writing the exhibition um, information that introduces the show to the public. And they, there you'll get hands-on experience. There's also um, just like artist residencies, there are curator residencies. And um, just kind of more of my background, I always thought that I wanted to be a writer growing up and then kind of took a turn during junior high, became an artist. Um, so I kind of have that mixture of both being um, an artist, a writer, a museum lover, a cultural producer. And then um, you kind of need to be a good people person too, I would say. There's a lot of opinions in art and being able to manage an array of different opinions comes in handy whenever you're um, trying to put a plan in, in place to curate an exhibition. Thank you, that's, that's incredibly helpful. And I think also I just wanna kind of add my two, two cents as, as someone who's been in the museum world and then um, and then now not in the nonprofit. Um, I, I would agree with Mariela so much that um, it really, you know, the experience um, really helps. I mean, she, she shared the experience of Angie, their director, who was an intern and then had them different, different positions and eventually became director. And so, you know, that's not everyone's route, but the, um, but, be, but being able to know that story is, I think, helpful for people to know that there's so many different routes out there to get to that kind of position. Uh, so I just wanted to add that. Um, I actually had two questions, but I'm going to ask one because I don't think I see another one down there. Um, one of them I have is, um, can you share an artist or team of artists that is or are high on your list that you would like to show at your institution and why so like really that that shining bright star that maybe you know might be a little too difficult to get for whatever reason financially or where they live or um i don't know any of those uh i think it'd be really cool to hear who's who's your your number one that you or you've been trying to to bring to your institution I'll just go ahead and say that an artist who's on my radar, her name's uh, Shicha Golap, um, Golapakrishnan. Um, she is like amazing, has a textile company um, called Kara Weaves, but also um, she makes these beautiful portraits and has started to include VR in her work too. So um, she talks about um, being a person of color and also uh, motherhood. Too. So she's kind of on my radar of wanting to work with her, but just need to figure out how. But I think that would be an amazing experience to bring to San Jose is um, augmented reality. Uh, mine actually, I mean, if you if I was on this panel like a year ago, Ebony G. Patterson would have been that person, um, which I, is just like so amazing that I got to do a show with her and bring her to the ICA. Um, so I guess curatorial dreams do come true. Um, but now I think, um, I mean, for me, Simone Lay, who is, um, going to be the United States representative for the 2022 Venice Biennale would be, that would be amazing. Um, she's going to be, she's like, is making history as like the first black woman to, be our country's like pavilion representative. So um, I think just think she's amazing. And um, just kind of like to be able to have a presentation of that artist kind of after that big accomplishment would be great as well. Um, I think for me, I have two. I have uh, one of them is Monica Kim Garza, who is a Mexican Korean artist that does these like huge um, paintings of women and a lot of her work uh, revolves around like women friendships and it's like, like like girls like lounging. It just reminds me of like me and my friends, which I think is like, like, I don't know. I'm just so fascinated with like friendships and um, platonic intimacy. And I think that she really does a great job at reflecting that. Um, and the other person is Gabriela Sanchez, who is an artist that incorporates a lot of typography in her work. and 
also just a lot of really beautiful colors. Um, I, I'm really hoping that soon we'll have her or both of them at, at MACLA um, just because their work is super, it's just, I mean, very colorful to begin with. And also um, I think it really represents a lot of the newer contemporary work that is coming um, within the Latinx scene. And yeah, it would be really great to host them. So. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but the three of you, the artists you've mentioned are all women. Um, and I think that's fantastic. I can't help but to point that out. So <laughs> um, I think another thing too, is that we are seeing, you know, you three um, are you know, new, newer curators to these institutions that have been a part of the, the, the San Jose arts community for, you know, 40 years. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm really curious to hear a little bit, I know don't, we, don't, we only have like a minute or two left, but um, you know, to hear a little bit on um, your curatorial philosophy and how it has changed or morphed um, and uh, what would you like to see different as you continue your work at your respective, at your institutions? Um, I'm sure it was very different when you joined your institutions and has changed as you've been there. Um, maybe you could speak a little, little tiny bit on that and then we'll say goodbye, so. Yeah, oh, oh go ahead. Well, I was just gonna start because I mean, my, I feel like the ICA has had the biggest institutional changes um, recently. So um, I think we've had executive director change. So that has been really impactful on um, what I've been able to do as a curator too. But I'll just say um, like two main things come to mind. One is actually like the use of the physical space. So the ICA San Jose did some renovations um, during COVID kind of took advantage of that time being closed. We took down a major wall that was like bisecting the space and making these smaller galleries. And now it's this like kind of like wide open um, one big gallery. So for me, I'm just curating physically on a different level and really seeing how artists can like take that space and how important it is to give work that breathing room. But also it's kind of shifted me to and I think you can see that in a presentation, go from these group shows to more larger presentations of solo exhibitions for artists, which I think is actually um, a better thing for their career and kind of where the ICA is moving towards too. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is just committing ourselves to showing a diverse range of artists. I mean, you can look back um, I mean, a lot of institutions are this way. It's not just us, but um, of just, especially who is getting those solo exhibitions and it really tends to be white men um, and just, you know, us as curators, like just pushing back against that and just being able to really like support artists from different backgrounds, um, making sure, of course, everyone gets paid as well, I think is really important. That is like, probably the number one thing in my philosophy is um, compensation for artists. So um, that has been like probably the biggest shift within my institution that I'm really proud to be a part of too. Um, and I think both with the physical space and that, um, that kind of more philosophical shift, Ebony G. Patterson is like a great kind of exhibition to show where we're going in the future. Thank you. That's awesome, Christine. Thank you so much. And it's great to hear that, you know, it definitely has been a big change on that block. Um, and that's a very color, colorful block. So <laughs> Amy, do you want to go next? I know you guys have a lot of color on your front as well. Yeah, and I think public art is having a huge moment right now because people couldn't go into physical spaces. I think my major takeaway of the year and a half um, has been that we have gained such a large audience that will never actually may not ever uh, visit San Jose and they may not ever come physically through our front door, but they're still in our sphere. And I think that it just gives San Jose a huge platform for the world um, to augment the area of voices. Great, thank you. And Mariela, did you want to share anything on, on that question? 
You're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I always do that. Um, when I first came on, I think one of the draws for, for me being a good fit for this job is because I was really focused on um, offering space for women artists to show their work and also whether whatever I mean whatever art because it was also with music um, and so now that has kind of morphed into um, just being even more um, inclusive in terms of you know making sure that I'm really incorporating incorporating like the work of black Latinx artists of queer Latinx artists so just making sure that you know the space that we have available is being made available to folks that usually don't have art spaces as easily and readily available for them as other artists do, so. Great, thank you. Well, um, thank you. I know that was a quick hour and we really appreciate you spending your uh, evening with us. Um, Thank you everyone for, for joining in the conversation. And this has actually been a recorded conversation. So it's gonna be available. I think Frederick will be posting that out. Um, please uh, do not forget to check out our closing of the RPM show at Camino Brewery on Sunday from five to seven, but go visit um, Sounds Museum of Clothes and Textiles first and then on, head on down to Camino. Um, but while you're there, don't forget about Mocklin ICA. So thank you again, everybody. Um, we really appreciate you being here tonight and don't forget to follow Gen Arts SV to find out about upcoming programs.